What wonderful songs have been chosen tonight because what they do is remind us of why we're Christians in the first place and why we love the Lord. We love the Lord because in spite of our failures and our faults, as I said the other night, our flaws, God loved us enough to decide to save us. God, before the foundation of the world, had already prepared redemptive religion. As someone has said, before there was sin, there was already a savior. Because God had planned to save us. Out of his love, his care, his kindness, his mercy, his providence, his long suffering. Man who he created, formed him from the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God had planted a garden east of Eden. A garden of Eden from the Hebrew meaning pleasantness. God had created a garden of pleasantness, everything pleasant to the eye, pleasant to the taste, to the touch, to the smell. Every sense that man has as God created us physically, he put something in the garden of Eden, the garden of pleasantness, paradise, in order to please that particular sense or those senses. God gave man one prohibition. He said, of all the trees that are in this garden, that you may eat of them except the tree that is in the midst. God said the tree that is in the midst and God said I'm going to put it in the middle if you let me paraphrase. So that you can't say well God I, did, I just didn't know which tree you were talking about. God put the tree in the middle in the midst. So that there was absolutely no way to mistake which tree he was talking about. When you think about all that God had done. What it does is remind us of his tremendous love. God didn't leave us, we left him. God did not offend us, we offended him. Man violated God's justice, his love, his mercy, and did exactly what God had commanded him not to do. And because of this, death was brought upon man, but we have the first messianic prophecy. Right there in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when God decides or allows man to know that there is a plan that the devil had not won. He may have won that battle, but he's not going to win the war. Because the devil brought the feud. The feud that had begun in heaven, he brought that feud down to man and caused man to stumble. And God deployed the best of heaven, his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Though man's body might perish, though his time on earth might be limited like a vapor or a diminishing flower, God still said, I'm going to save my children. I'm going to save them. And God sent someone in order to save us. <clears throat> and that was his son, Jesus. I'm reminded when I was a child, before I went to sleep, my great grandmother, Sister Mary Garrett, she taught me to pray. And I've said this everywhere I've gone. She taught me to get down on my knees because when Big Papa died, Brother Enos Garrett, and I stayed with her at night. All three of us were side by side right there in Memphis. My grandparents, my parents, and my great-grandparents. I was very blessed. And she would tell me to get down on my knees and she would teach me this prayer. And she said, Nick, pray before you go to bed. And of course, it's a prayer that I venture that every one of you prayed. The prayer was, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Then I would pray for everybody, mom and dad, and grandpa, the dog, the cat, and everybody before I went to sleep. But that prayer, I can remember big mama sitting on the side of that bed with a big smile on her face as she taught me to pray. What she taught me through that prayer and what I learned subsequently from my family as the years went by, that somebody loved me. We get grown, 
we get educated, sophisticated, we get articulate and charismatic, we become so competent in our lives with prefixes and suffixes on our name and nothing's wrong with that. But somewhere along the line, we forget that the Lord loves us. The children know it. The children will stand up and proudly sing. And I can remember my grandchildren when they were younger and my children when they were younger, that they would sing, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Isn't it a shame that we get grown and we forget that Jesus loves us and that God cares about us? God does not want any of us to perish. God is not willing that any should perish. He would have all men to be saved and come to repentance. As we study tonight and as you continue to study and this congregation that has been so well taught for well over four decades, I want us always to think about the simple things. Jesus loves us, he cares about us, and he wants us to come home one day. This is not home. This is not your home. You're just passing through. We're a colony of heaven. Heaven is our home. Our citizenship is there. And one day you want to go home and be with your Lord who has prepared the room for you. Think about that as we study. There are so many things that break our heart and so many things that aren't nice to talk about. We talk about them because we're Christians and we have to be prepared for them. Pray with me briefly. Merciful God, our Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord and our Savior, we thank you for this day. As we stand before your people, <clears throat> the greatest people on earth, we pray the things that we say and do will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in the 1950s, that was a, a gentleman by the name of George Reeves. <clears throat> And he played the original Superman. I can remember sitting down in front of the black and white with a very small screen uh, compared to the screens today with a big bowl of popcorn and some Kool-Aid at my grandmama's house. She had one of the first TVs around there. And I can remember on Saturday morning, look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. And I can remember, you know, you found yourself a towel or something and you tied around your neck and we flew all over the neighborhood pretending to be Superman. And Superman bursting through walls and standing in front of bullets as they bounced off his, check and his chest and outrunning a locomotive and jumping over buildings with a single bound. Well, that was a great fantasy for us as a child. And it was a great entertaining morning to watch Superman on television. But then George Reeves had a problem. The problem was George Reeves, who played Superman for so many years, that he began to become the role that he played. Somewhere along the line, he began to live a delusion that he was, in, in essence, a superman. He, he loved the notoriety. He loved the fact that folks recognized him in the street. And because things changed when he stopped playing Superman, in 1959, George Reeves, according to the news, put a bullet in his head and ended his life because he could no longer live the delusion, the heartbreak, and the depression that he was living in. There was a gentleman by the name of Clayton Moore. Between 1949 and 1957 on ABC television, Clayton Moore on silver, how silver away. And oh my goodness, we all had masks and our six shooters on the side. My mama used to laugh because you didn't go out of the house without your guns on. You know, it was a different time back then, Justice. If you didn't have your guns on, you didn't have nothing on. We might be in the supermarket. You see another kid in the aisle and you stop. You get ready to draw. And you know, my mama would just shake her head and walk away because she knew we had to carry that thing out. 
Well, the fact of the matter is, Clayton Moore, at a certain point in time, began to be delusional also. He became the Lone Ranger. They had to take him to court to make him take the mask off. And then for many years, many of you might remember, he wore big dark glasses that looked like a mask because he was living his life in the delusion of being the Lone Ranger. Eventually, in 1984, they granted him the right to wear the mask. Since he was the most recognizable person as the Lone Ranger, they let him wear that mask again. And until he died in 1999, Clayton Moore wore that mask everywhere he went because he had become the Lone Ranger. We might look at Adam West, Batman in the 1960s, Jerry Mather, the Beaver, you remember that show, Jimmy Walker, J.J. in the sitcom Good Times, Sherman Hensley, uh, who was always George Jefferson, no matter where you saw him, he was George Jefferson. The point being, and the relevance of all of this is, when you lose sight of reality, when you lose sight of who you are, who you really are, and what you really are, this is what the devil wants to do to every last one of us because the devil knows you have a last day coming. And if he can make you walk in darkness, in a delusion, in a fantasy world, telling yourself that you're something that you're not. How many folks out in the world today are telling themselves that they are children of God? Telling themselves and convincing themselves in a delusion that they are Christians, convincing themselves that they are following the truth when there's no truth in what they believe, telling themselves that they're on the way to heaven and they're so glad, but they're on the way to hell and it's too bad. Why is that? Because the devil wants to make every last one of us refuse the truth and accept a lie, a distraction, and a delusion. I told you I would probably quote it every night, and I would keep my word. Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verses 8, be sober, be sober. Don't get caught in the devil's lies. Be sober, be vigilant, open your eyes and see the truth. What's the truth about you? How many times have we seen people, people that have a photograph and you'll take their picture back in the days of Polaroid and you would give them the picture and they'll say, that's not me. That's you. I just took the picture. No, that's not me. And this is what they're saying is that's me from a perspective I don't care for. And when the word of God, when this perfect law of liberty, when this glass shows you a reflection of yourself, how many folks would rather live the delusion than actually do what they should do and face the truth. This is why the Lord said in Luke 13, if you don't repent, except you repent, except you repent, you shall perish. He spoke to that woman, that woman who no doubt had probably lived in a life of fantasy, fooling herself that she may have been living a good life or making a good living. I don't know what was going on with that woman but I know the Bible says she was caught in sin in the very act. And when they had brought this woman before the Lord for him to do what they were also doing, and that is condemn her to die. The Lord looked at them and said, those of you, <coughs> excuse me, who are without sin, you cast the first stone. And after they began to walk away from the youngest to the oldest and dropping their bricks, their stones, that they were going to bludgeon that poor woman to death, she probably eventually looked up into the eyes of the Lord. You know what the Lord said to her? The Lord said to her, I don't condemn you, but you stop sinning. You stop sinning. You go and you sin no more. What I like about the Lord is he tells it like it is. He told that woman, you stop sinning. When he met the woman at the well and the Samaritan woman, 
who's pointing to a mountain where her culture, her tradition, and everything she knew said, that's the way we should worship, and that's what we should worship. She was caught up in what many are caught up in today, their fantasies, their traditions, and the things that have been. The Lord let, the, let this woman know that mountain is not it anymore. You don't worship that mountain. You worship God. God is a spirit. He is a spirit being. John chapter 4, verses 24, And they that worship him must. It's a divine injunction. God says, I don't need you being delusional. I don't need you in a fantasy. I don't need you substituting church going for Christianity. I don't need you to play. I don't need thine oblations. I, God says, I don't need vain worship. I don't need you honoring me with your mouth while your heart is from far from me. He said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. When we sang a few minutes ago from those well-chosen songs, when we sang together and lifted up our hearts, our voices, in love and adoration to our Father, that's what God wants. But see, but God's not listening to whether the bass is on cue and the alto and the sopranos and, every, and the tenors and everybody is singing as the music on the board. No, God's looking at the heart. God's smelling the sweet-smelling savor of reverence and thanksgiving and love from people who say, thank you, Jesus, Every day, when I wake up in the morning, Brother Taylor, the older I get, like my grandmother used to tell me, just keep on living. And every, when I can get up and I can turn around in the bed and I can stand up and go about my day, I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because it is only he that takes care of me each and every day of my life. How many folks, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Live in a delusion, refusing to accept God. What we see in our society today are men and women who are living the delusion that science and academia and the medical world and digging in the bottom of the ocean, going in outer space, that they can find the origins of man. Well, you know, I know where I came from, and I don't go to the zoo to visit relatives. You know, basically, I know that God formed me from the dust of the earth, breathed into my nostrils the breath of life. I became a living soul because God created me. Creation demands a creator. Life demands a life giver. Design demands a designer. And because I choose to look at the truth, I can see who God is, that there is a God, even when there are those who refuse the truth about our God and our Father in heaven. The Apostle Paul speaking to the brethren at Rome, the book of Romans is often called the book that changed the world. Paul said to those brethren in Romans chapter 1 and verses 16, as all of you probably can quote, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first, Paul said also to the Greek. But notice what he said in verses 17. For therein, where? In the word. Not in the science book, not in the math book, the sociology book, the history book, the medical book. Therein, where? Within the word of God. He said it's the righteousness revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. From that faith that gives me an understanding of my creator, it goes to faith that will lead me to be faithful and steadfast my entire life. The source, faith, leads to the end, faith. In verses 20, the apostle Paul said to the brethren at Rome, he said, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, 
even his eternal power and Godhead. In other words, his divine nature. There are three divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You have three divine personalities with one divine nature. Three with one aim. And the Apostle Paul speaks of the Godhead. The Godhead decided to save us. The Godhead created redemptive religion. God the Father always tells what's going to be done. God the Father is the one that sent the Son. When God the Father plans, God the Son executes. God plans the Father. The Son executes. If God said somebody, we're going to die in their place. The devil is crying, foul, foul, hold on now. You said they were going to die. They're going to physically die. But we're going to die in their place. Can you see the Hadean ram with a chuckle? You can't die. You're a spirit. God made one in the Godhead, the Son, become flesh so that he could execute perpetuation. If God says we're going to die in, our, in their place, then somebody's got to become flesh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus, incarnate, became that which dies in our place. Jesus is my substitute. Brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't just die for my sins. Jesus died in my place. Jesus committed no sins, did no wrong. Jesus died in my place. And the Apostle Paul wanted us to understand this. David wanted us to understand this in Psalms 19 verses 1 and verses 2. What we see in the world today, what we see is as they deface churches and statues. While we don't build statues, they are still emblems in our society. What we see are men and women who have rejected the Bible, burning the American flag and burning the Bible with it because they are saying we want the standard removed and we want to do as we see fit. The result of refusing the evidence of God, the result of refusing the divinity and, and, uh, and, uh, and sovereignty of God, the power and the majesty of God is a delusion, a delusion. David said in Psalm 14 and verses 1, he said, the fool, the fool, has said in his heart, there is no God. David didn't say the fool said, I don't believe in God. David said somewhere in the fool's heart, in his mind, in his thinking, he has failed to respect the one that created him. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. David goes on to say they are corrupt they have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. What do we see happening today? Think of all the corruption and the perversion. You can't even let your children see, watch television. You can hardly let them listen to the radio. You have to watch them carefully when they're on their devices and telephones. You have to determine and censor what they hear, the people that they meet. Why? Because corruption is normal. What we have done is said that those things that were once religiously wrong are now morally right. Because as I said last evening, we have homogenized, pasteurized, repackaged, and remarketed sin to where we call evil good and good evil. This is a delusion. And the delusion that we're living in in America today will destroy this country from the inside. I think I told you Sunday that Khrushchev said a long time ago when I was a boy 
I remember hearing about it from our weekly reader in the television where he said, we will destroy America without firing a shot. In other words, he said, I will put you against one another, black against white, north against south, rich against poor. And what do we see today? Every day played out in front of us. Isaiah, the son of Amos, used this word delusion in his final prophecy to God's stubborn people. It didn't matter what God had done to, for them. It didn't matter that God had cared for them. They still rejected God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 66 and verses 1, he begins by asserting the sovereignty of God. Thus says the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, and that says God is not limited. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. In that sense, God has all power, all knowledge, and he's everywhere. Having said that, then Isaiah gives God's a curse upon Israel to his disobedient people who delight in their own delusion. Here is what God said. You delight in your delusion, in your fantasy, in what you believe is right, in the way you want to go. As a matter of fact, when Joshua died, as every one of you in this room know, that terrible thing was said, that assessment was made. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. What do we see happening around us today? Today, because we have removed the king from the throne, because we've taken Jesus from the eyes of the people, because we've snatched the Bible away from our children, because we've removed the crosses off the graves of American soldiers who gave their last measure of devotion, because we've tried to sanitize the country, in such a way to make this a secular nation, now we see the results of that delusion. God said, if you're going to have a delusion, I'm going to choose the delusion. God said in Isaiah 66 and verses 4, I also will choose their delusion and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called None did answer. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that which I delight not. God says they decided to disobey me. They decided to walk away from me. They decided to follow that which was perverse and corrupt. God says, I will choose their delusion. I'm going to bring their fears up on them. When we look around us right now, anxiety and fear, the suicide rate in America is skyrocketing, and the age of those who are committing self-murder is getting younger and younger and younger, all the way down to first graders. What in the world has a first grader done that they don't want to live another day? But God wanted us always to understand when we refuse the truth, then the delusions take over. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and verses 11, that word delusion in the New Testament means energy of deceit. Wandering era, where the Bible says, Paul speaking to the brethren at Thessalonica, in that sinful city filled with idolatry and debauchery and perversion and corruption, as God's people are trying to live for Jesus, you know what Paul said? And with all deceivableness or deception of unrighteousness, in them that perish, 
Why, Paul? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. God is saying, I'm trying to save you and you won't let me. I'm trying to teach you and you won't listen. I'm trying to lead you and you won't follow. I'm trying to help you and you reject me. And when we look at America today, we can see God's disappointment and his heartbreak when we consider that this great democracy, with all of its fears and faults and failures and fantasies, and all of the things that we wish had never happened, still is the world's best hope because of the men and women who pray and who follow the word in this country. But when we refuse, in verses 11, you know what Paul said to the brethren at Thessalonica? He said, for this cause, because God called and you didn't answer, because God came and you wouldn't follow. He said, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie, a lie that marriage can be between a man and a man, a lie that that human being inside the womb is not a human being. I always wondered how a human male and a human female could follow God's law of procreation and have something that was not human. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 1, as God spoke to him rather, God said, before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. But if you get caught in the delusion that that's not a human being, that that's not a person, that that's just a little bit of flesh, that was a college girl holding a sign on her college university campus that said, parasites don't have rights. And when I looked at that over the internet, I had to say, Lord have mercy. What have these children been taught that they have such a delusion? Brothers and sisters, this is what Paul was saying. Paul says, when God gives us the truth and we refuse the truth, the result is a delusion. When Paul was speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5, he talked about those having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, Paul said, from such turn away. What's the problem, Paul? He told Titus in Titus chapter 1, verses 16, Paul said, they profess, they claim, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. And look at this next word. He said, being abominable, abominable, as Paul said, they are disobedient. And in every good work, Paul said, reprobate, or they disappoint, or they shame God. Remember what Solomon said in Proverbs 14 and 34. He said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. In essence, brothers and sisters, the time comes when we have to face facts. When David wrote in Psalms 10 and verses 4, he lets us know what the problem is. Pride, 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 pride. That's the problem. Secular humanism and materialism and worldliness takes a hold on a society that's filled with pride. He said the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in his thoughts. Paul wanted the brethren at Rome to know that it's God that brought you through. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul said, For when you were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Just like that prayer I prayed as a child, and I venture many of you prayed as a child. God wanted us to understand what was said in John 15 and 13, Greater love had no man than this 
that a man, that one, laid down his life for his friends. The devil is doing everything he can to destroy each of us one at a time. And this is why we've got to listen to the truth. This is why we got to turn off the news commentators. Turn off the talk show hosts. Turn off the internet. Take that device from those children sometime. Get them a paper Bible and make them sit down and turn pages and read what's in the Bible. Because as the Apostle Paul was warning us, he said in the book of Colossians, Paul wanted us to keep this in mind. He said, beware, beware, lest any man spoil you, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. When the Apostle Paul was speaking to the brethren through Titus, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, Paul wanted uh, uh, Titus to remember and to teach them that they've got to live soberly and righteously and godly in this world. When we lose sight of that, then we find ourselves in a delusion. One time the apostles came to Jesus. I want to leave you with this. They came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through verses 8, and subsequent scriptures. Jesus had stood there and preached. He had told them that he was the Son of God. They came to Jesus saying, why don't your disciples wash their hands? They're not washing their hands after the traditions of the elders. They had this delusion that their rules, the doctrines and commandments of men were greater than those things that God had given. You know what the apostles did? They came to the Lord. They said, Jesus, oh, Jesus, don't you know that they were offended by what you were saying? They were offended, Lord. When you told them you were the son of God, when you told them that your law was greater than the elders, Lord, they were offended by what you said. How many of us today are so concerned about political correctness? Speaking right, we walk around on eggshells, afraid to open our mouth because of the current distress. You know what Jesus said to them? Jesus said, every plant, that my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. Jesus said every doctrine, commandment, tradition, everything that is taught that my heavenly father has not ordained, he shall be rooted up. And then he gave them a little bit of advice that we need to follow even to this day, not to get caught up in other men's sin. He said, leave them alone. He said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, the Lord said they both fall into the ditch. We have to open our eyes and make sure that we don't get caught in the delusion of other people as they refuse to serve God. When you've heard about your Savior and you believe that he is the son of God. Thomas sit there and said, I'm not going to believe it. If I can't put my hands in his side, if I'm not able to put my hands where those nails were, I am not going to believe it. And to this day, we still call him Doubting Thomas. I can see the Lord. Can you see his eyes as big as half dollars? When the Lord walked in there and said, come over here, Thomas. No, Lord, no, no, no. You come on, Thomas. Come on. Come on, Thomas, put your hand in my hand. Reach your hand in my cloak and feel where they pierced my heart, where they stuck that spear in my side. Come on, Thomas. Thomas believed it because he saw it. But don't you understand who you are? You're those people that Jesus said, blessed are those who will believe, Thomas, and didn't have to touch me and feel me and fondle me and hold me the way you had to do. That's you. You didn't see the Lord walk on the water, but you believe it. 
You didn't see him heal that poor woman who was crawling with her last strength because of her disease, saying, if I can touch the hem of his garment, if I can just get to the hem of his garment, I will be saved. But you believe it. You believe that those men who had to cry out, unclean, unclean, because they had leprosy, ten of them, and while the apostles were going back and covering their face, Jesus walked up and touched them, communed with them, cleansed their skin as the day they were born. We didn't see it, but we believe it. I believe with all of my heart that a young man was put over a scourging post and beat 39 times because I sinned, because we sinned, because man sinned. And this young man took all those scourging licks just so I can stand here in the church having my sins removed by baptism and live with a God who loves me and forgives me every time I make a mistake when I acknowledge his lordship and his love. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe it, therefore I see it. And therefore I repent of my sins. I say, Lord, if you can send your son and he can say no to the lust of the flesh, the eye and the pride of life, I'm going to live better because of him. And I'm going to confess and tell everybody everywhere that I believe that Jesus is the son of God. It doesn't matter the delusion everybody else lives in, but I'm going to live in the light and I'm going to walk in the light. And I'm going to mortify my old man. Anything dead need burying. You bury your old man in a watery grave. You rise to walk in the newness of life. There was a story once of a lady who was chosen for a television show. And she was chosen because she was a hoarder. And she had a house full, just filled with junk. And they came to her house and they set up the cameras and the dumpsters all around her house. And it took them several days to get all of that stuff out of, their, of her house. They found dead animals packed under stuff that were in the house, flattened like cardboard. But they cleaned it all out. And we're going to come back to paint and put new furniture in and start her all over. When they turned the cameras off and they went home, she would go out and climb over in the dumpster and brought all that stuff back in the house. They come the next day and the stuff was in the house. They threw it all away again into the dumpster. And, and, and they would come back the next day and she had climbed in again and put it all back in the house. Eventually they said, that's enough. We're done move the cameras, walk away. They said she's become too comfortable in her mess. And how many of us in our lives, if we don't resist the devil and love the Lord and let him strengthen us and lift us up, the devil wants us to become too comfortable in our delusion. See the Lord for who he is, the love that he has given and one day, let's all go home together to heaven. Think about it while we stay.